is an internationally recognized health and medical writer, consultant, and lecturer on addiction. He has created courses on addiction at Cape Cod Community College and writes the popular Cape Cod Times advice column on addiction. He is also the author of the booklet, Up in Smoke, and the book, Addicted, a guide to understanding addiction. Now, Tom O'Connell. Hi, welcome to Understanding Addiction. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about why we become addicted and I'm going to explore some terms and definitions in this process. Addiction is what I believe is the world's most serious health problem. There are many theories about it and some of them are controversial. It's a very complicated subject. To understand addiction we have to realize that it's more than just chemicals. It involves things like work and relationships and gambling and drugs and, and even habits like perfection that can become addictive and other love, love objects. Uh, as far as definitions go, addiction is one of the most fascinating things that I've ever come across, the whole concept of addiction. And in that field, there is much research that remains to be done. But alcoholism has been studied very much, and some of the definitions that have come to us about addiction have come through the root of alcoholism. The World Health Organization, for example, calls alcoholism and addiction a chronic behavioral disorder. It involves words like excess, and it interferes with our health. The American Medical Association uses the word illness and preoccupation and the phrase loss of control. And the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence calls it a continuing problem. It's chronic, progressive, and sometimes fatal. It involves tolerance and dependency. And it brings us to the notion of disease. What is a disease? There are various definitions. One of them is one that says it impairs our ability to function. Another one is the word disorder an upset of the normal functions, and illness is called a condition of being in poor health. And basically, the words all mean the same thing. Dr. Gary Forrest out in Colorado calls addiction a search for love, and Dr. Douglas Talbot down in Georgia calls it, says people are addicted to feelings, and that's why they become addicted. Bill McHugh at the Third Nail Drug Program told me once that addiction was an attempt to fill the hole in the donut, and that's that empty inner space that we seem to have in us. And the junkie priest, Father Dan Egan down in New York, told me about the lack of love again and the spiritual void that people are trying to fill. One of my favorite definitions is the one by Dr. Stanley Gitlow from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And his emphasis uh, is, is on the factor that we turn to addiction in order to adapt to the problems of life. And we do this instead of interpersonal relating. Today in the United States, we have a lot of people that instead of interpersonal relating are substituting drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. And today in this country, we have a lot of deaths going on and impairments due to the use of these substances. You can see from this little chart that the illicit drug problem is killing far fewer people than our legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco. Is this problem a problem mainly of the United States? I'd like to talk a little bit about the international aspects of addiction. I believe addiction is a human problem and it goes with the human condition and it's a worldwide problem. And I visited Israel a few years ago to attend the first international conference there on alcoholism and the family. And I learned that in Israel alcoholism is growing. There's a network of clinics to treat it. Drug addiction is also being treated. And what they're doing in Israel is tending to copy what we do here in our society. So our, ba our bad habits in America tend to go around the world as we send products in their direction and we do marketing campaigns to sell our addictive substances. I also learned that in Yugoslavia they were having problems 
with alcohol and drugs, especially in the under age 30 group. In Australia, they were having a lot of problems, uh, and they had special problems with the native population in beer drinking. And in Alaska, I learned that people are drinking to oblivion you know, until they pass out. In Rome, where people have the illusion that there's no real alcohol problem. I learned from top officials there that drunkenness is accepted, and that's why it's not listed as a major problem. And drugs are also growing, their use is growing in Italy. I visited a treatment center in Rome, and I was told by Juan Corelli, who was the head of that drug treatment program, that the basic problem of alcohol and drugs and other additions, uh, addictions is a problem of values. It's a problem of character. It's a problem of a way of living. And this, is, this ties in with my own basic belief system. Uh, in Egypt, I also found out that there were less alcohol problems, but drug problems were growing, especially problems of using hashish and opium. So my impressions from my explorations in other parts of the world and talking to experts from other parts of the world is that we have a worldwide problem of addiction, but awareness is growing. And cooperation is very necessary, and that's growing too. <clears throat> and treatment is becoming more available everywhere. Uh, key things that are needed, a lot more research and a lot more prevention education. In Scotland, I attended a special conference on alcohol and drugs in the workplace, and it was organized by the Church of Scotland and the Swedish Christian Temperance Federation, the Swedish Carnegie Institute, and America's North Conway Institute. And some of the concepts that were discussed there were fascinating to me. They called drugs a contagious phenomenon, and I now think of drug addiction and other addictions as contagious diseases, diseases of the personality that we spread to each other. And th these diseases affect our memory, they affect our hygiene, they affect our motivation, our stamina, and our discipline, and so therefore they affect our productivity in the workplace. In Sweden, I learned about a network of 100 day centers for addiction. And then in, in Scotland, I learned that the church there was incredibly active in the world of addiction, and they had developed a therapeutic network throughout the country. And they were basing their services on individuals, person-centered services. We need more of that. Addiction is holistic. It involves the whole person. And no two people are exactly alike, so the treatment is not exactly alike for any two people either. In Ireland, I learned about over-drinking and the love affair that the Irish have with the drink and competitive drinking, and I also learned about the combination of the two extremes in Ireland, the heavy drinkers and those who take the pledge. So there's each kind in that population. Serious problem, addiction, in Ireland and in other places around the world. And it goes back to some simple notions, I believe, and <clears throat> one of them is the Latin word itself, the word that we got the word for, uh, addict from. It means devoted. And in ancient Rome, the phrase ad dictum meant a prison sentence, and it was a kind of slavery. It's going into bondage, and anyone who's ever been addicted severely understands that bondage and that slavery. We start with experiment, we move to habit, we develop dependence, and eventually we're addicted, and we're in a disease process. Now, I'd like to just discuss a little bit about the disease process. In 1956, the American Medical Association finally described alcoholism as an illness after many years of not doing so. Ten years later, alcoholism was finally described as a disease on a par with other diseases. And in 1987, just a few years ago, the American Medical Association finally said all drug dependencies are diseases. What, is, what does a disease do? It impairs our normal functions. It has a set of causes. It has easily recognized symptoms. P people suffer and die from it, and it has a predictable course, and addiction fits these qualifications for disease. Addiction itself, what is it? Addiction is a condition of unhealthy dependence that impairs our ability to perform to our full potential. Addiction is a disease. And dependence, with a capital D, is another notion I'd like to explore. In the state of addiction, which is unhealthy dependence, we find ourselves suffering a lot of tension, we end up with emotional pain as well as physical pain, and we end up with a state of extreme dependence on something outside of ourselves to keep us going, and that's a bad condition to be in. The, another set of initials I'd like to think about for a minute are the PMESS of addiction. 
physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual. That's what addiction does to us. It's holistic. It affects our whole being. And the next set of initials I'd like to explore, I describe as the five C's of addiction. And this involves craving, compulsion, loss of control, continuing a behavior, in spite of the life-damaging consequences, in spite of the consequences to ourselves and to the people around us. Genetics, is that a factor in addiction? Heredity? Well, it sure is, but it isn't the whole story. We, we found out that children of alcoholics have an increased risk of becoming addicted themselves. We found out that they have faster brain rhythms and there are probably many other impairments. We've learned that fetal alcohol syndrome is a major problem and this has a similar kind of devastation uh, when smokers have children. It affects, if, someone is, if a woman is smoking uh, during the pregnancy, if a woman is drinking during the pregnancy, there are major problems with the delivery of the new being. And this also may involve the father too. And there's studies of coming through now that indicate that. It's valuable to learn this information. It helps in prevention, it helps in detoxification, and it helps in treatment. Science is doing wonderful things for us. It's learning about nerve pathways in the brain and neurotransmitters and all kinds of things. But the experts tell us today that heredity is a factor but not the whole cause of addiction, and it's still not fully clear what's being transmitted. In Denmark, a famous study discussed sons of alcoholic fathers, and they found that three, they had three to four times the risk of suffering from alcoholism compared to kids without alcoholic parents. But the thing I want to point out is three quarters of those sons of alcoholic fathers didn't end up becoming alcoholic. So we have to be careful about these studies, and we have to be careful about jumping to conclusions about them. We have to be careful about studies that say that drinking is good for your heart, or good for your other parts of your body. Is it good for your liver? Is it good for your stomach? Is it good for your thyroid and your pancreas? Other studies indicate the devastation that alcohol can do. Now I'd like to look at some of the factors that we need to remember when we're thinking about addiction. One of them is allergy. It's related to the body. It's physical. And in, in Greek, allergy came from the words that meant altered energy. And the, another key word is sensitivity. Addicts, as well as other human beings, are very sensitive. The more heavily addicted people tend to be most sensitive. And then there's disposition. Are we disposed to be addicted by either heredity or the way we were brought up? And then the word tendency. And my personal belief is that all human beings have a tendency to be somewhat addicted some of the time in their lives. And this varies in intensity as you go through life. So science has limits. Science still doesn't understand what gravity is. And science doesn't fully understand what energy is. And I believe that we have to look more carefully at the human condition itself. And we have to remember that just because there are certain factors that are common in addiction, factors are not causes. They're just things that happen to be there. For example, if a car hits a tree, the tree just happens to be there. The tree didn't cause the accident. And there's a, that, that analogy applies to a lot of the research that's done in the world of addiction. I'm more concerned about the psychology of addiction and the spirituality. In the end of psychology, in that aspect of looking at addiction, we, we find things like love deprivation. We, we find things like abuse and neglect as major factors in why people become addicted. addicted. We find lack of nurturing as a big item. And abandonment at any time during one's life can lead a person into addiction. And then things like losing a parent or losing a brother or a sister. And childhood trauma of many kinds can influence later addictions. Heredity, it may be part of the picture, but it's only part of the picture. I think we have more information now about the world of psychology and how the family can impact on addiction and how childhood trauma can impact on addiction. And so we don't have to put all of our efforts into just the scientific end of things. The psychology, the psyche, which means the soul, and the spirit are key items in addiction and addiction recovery. Carl Gustav Jung, one of the eminent psychologists of this century, described addiction as a spiritual thirst for wholeness, a misguided quest. Addicts actually are devoted to this quest, and they end up in bondage. They end up depressed. They end up exhausted. They end up cynical. They end up alienated from themselves, from others, and their higher power. 
So what I think addiction does, and, and, and to follow up on this notion of alienation and how it affects us when we're addicted, I've formed a few triangles to illustrate that, and I call this the addiction triangle. And what happens here is the S at the bottom of each triangle means self, and as you go from left to right, the A means addiction, and the other S means also self. We're separated from ourself, we're alienated from ourself through addiction. The middle triangle, we're alienated, alienated from other people through our addiction, and on the right-hand triangle, we're alienated from God, our higher power, through addiction. Addiction, it's a separating influence. It separates us from our inner self, our higher self. It separates us from other people and good relationships, and it separates us from the higher power. And in recovery, we need to change that. And there are certain recovery realities I'd like to think about now. And in recovery, we've got to work on our thinking as well as our drinking and smoking and all the other activities. We've got to work on our words and deliver words of love to people and not words of criticism. We have to work on our actions and we have to work on our reactions. We literally have to change our whole personalities when we're addicted. This is the challenge and this is why it isn't easy to give up an addiction and start a new way of life. But in recovery, we find that the triangle gradually gets dissolved we can literally dissolve the triangle and end up with a straight line relationship with ourself, with other people, and with our higher power. And there are only three relationships in this world that we have to think about. The relationship with self, the relationship with others, everything outside of us, and the relationship with the higher power. When we have those relationships in balance, we're leading a good, wholesome life. So why do we become addicted? There are many factors, and they're physical, like allergy, obsession, heredity, kinds of imbalance, social, cultural pressures, and spiritual inclinations, or spiritual disinclinations, the opposite of spirituality. Ultimately, I think it comes back to the sensitivity of the human condition, the desire to feel better. And to illustrate that, I use initials S-A-A-H. And what this simply means is that we all come into the world through the womb, a fairly safe place, and we're expelled into a place that makes us feel anxious and makes us hungry to be attached. And so I think the human condition means having a longing to connect. And in the addiction process, another, another set of characteristics that lead to each other, we start out with the simple thing of experimenting, and then our feelings change, and then we form habits, and we become dependent on those habits to change our feelings, and we ultimately can become addicted. That's unhealthy dependence. So what we're dealing with here is a cycle, and it's a cycle of discomfort in which we experiment and eventually can become addicted. It, there's a mix of craving and tension and suspense. We may defend or deny the habit until you know we, we are confronted with it by other people, that we've got a serious problem that needs to be dealt with, and we end up with self-destruction as part of the process. We end up deluded and self-deceived and our values become eroded. Also in addiction, there, there is another little set of initials, I call it the OC of addiction. It's extremely important because obsession and compulsion are the driving forces in our addictions. Obse in obsession, we're haunted, we're driven. The D, D, T, and W is the next set of initials to help you understand addiction a little better. Uh, and this involves defending the behavior. You know, I don't drink that much, and if you work the way I work, you'd need to do this too. And denial, I don't have a problem. You know, I don't have a problem, I can handle it. Tolerance means we need more and more to get the same effect. And with withdrawal, we ends up, end up with all kinds of unpleasant symptoms. They could be physical tremors, they could be emotional problems and depression, even suicidal depression and withdrawal from our addictions. And then we have the CPF of addiction, it's chronic. It tends to go on over a long period of time. It, it progressively worsens, and although some people can stay in a holding pattern, and it's potentially fatal if we persist in being addicted and don't turn to its recovery. The ism of addiction is another notion I'd like to, to think about for a minute, and the ISM is simply insecure, supersensitive, and moody. These are characteristics that go with addiction. These are characteristics of addicts of all kinds. And when you get to know addicts and how they deal with life, you understand the, these three initials, insecure, 
I, super sensitive S, and moody M. Now I'd like to go through the addiction cycle. And this tends to repeat itself over and over throughout a lifetime. It starts with discomfort, and then we want some relief, and then we have this anticipation of relief. We have a love object that we will chase, and we expect it to change our mood and get us high or maybe get us low or get us mellow. And the whole intention, escape from our inner reality and find that relief. And then, eventually, it all fades. We have withdrawal symptoms. We're back to the discomfort. And on again we go into the cycle over and over. The whole person is affected, the whole human being. And in healing, the same thing has to take place. It's not a simple thing like stopping the addiction and suddenly you're all better. There's a body to heal. There's a thinking process to restore. There are feelings to get in touch with. There is relating to learn how to do in a loving, kind way with other human beings. And there's a spiritual awakening that's necessary. And this is absolutely necessary to fully recover from the addictive process. And what do we do in this recovery? We reach a turning point that tells us that we need to recover and we make a decision to change. And then we turn to help that's needed and we learn to heal the human spirit that's in us. And we hang out with other people who have similar desires, kindred spirits who want to heal their addictions and they want to transform themselves and go on a spiritual journey. And now we're into another triangle that I just want to briefly look at and this is called the addiction triangle and it's a t an attempt to fill emptiness. And it's a bottomless pit that can't be filled with people, places, and things. It can only, you can't fill a spiritual emptiness with people, places, and things. You can only fill it with something else that's spiritual that you have to develop in your life. So the key to recovery, I call the key to recovery the healing of the human spirit. And when we're trying to heal the human spirit, what we're really doing is getting in touch with love and truth. And these are the ancient messages that have come to us through the ages from leaders and masters in spirituality throughout the history of mankind. That's what we're still doing today. We're learning from those basic truths and they lead us back to love, love of self, love of others, and love of a higher power. The road to recovery, what kind of a road is it? Well, it's a road in which you have to admit the problem, number one, and then surrender to the fact that you have it and realize that you need help. And then the challenge of changing behavior, which is probably the biggest challenge in any one individual's life, how to change behavior. But there are many ways to help us do that. You know, there are all kinds of, of groups. There are recovery groups uh, that are self-help groups. There's individual treatment. And there are therapists of all kinds and clinics. And what we can do little by little, one step at a time and one day at a time, is gain new insights, new habits, new values, and end up with new freedom. What is this new freedom? The freedom to be yourself. Not what someone else wants you to be, or someone else expects you to be. The freedom to be fully you. That's the gift of addiction recovery. And we end up healing the whole spirit, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. Because I believe we're spiritual beings, and the only way we can fill that empty triangle is to fill it with something, something spiritual. And so uh, we go to this other triangle now that I call the addiction recovery triangle. And in this particular triangle, we work toward a spiritual solution to our physical, mental, emotional, and social problems, and we end up fulfilled. We end up with new energy. We end up with the energy that's in all of us all of the time, but we're seldom tapping it to its fullest. So what does recovery do to us? It dissolves our addictions. By accepting them, they gradually dissolve. By realizing that we can change, we give less energy to the addiction. We get in touch with ourselves. We get in touch with others. We get in touch with a higher power, but it takes time. And the fact that it takes time is one of the reasons that people often relapse into addiction. They're impatient and they won't take the time. They won't go to enough meetings and have enough therapy and they want to change overnight and they get discouraged too easily when they don't change. They don't seem to realize that recovery is a process and not an event. It's a process that's slow sometimes and other times it's faster. But the recovery process, the way I look at it today, I want to emphasize that recovery is a process and not an event, 
is a process that includes joy, it includes grief, and it includes sometimes painful healing. But it's a journey, and it keeps changing, and I think it's an adventure, an adventure of the human spirit, and it's a journey that we should learn to enjoy. In addiction, we take trips into our lower selves. In recovery, we take a journey into the higher self. And as you pursue your journey into your higher self, and as you see other people around you pursuing their journey into their higher self, I think what you're seeing is one of the miracles of the 20th century in operation. I think today in our world, we probably have more addiction than has ever existed in the history of the human race. We have addiction at levels that cause more death and destruction than all of the wars that we've had in the history of the human race. But we also have something else happening. We have a new awareness about addiction today. We have new recovery processes going on today. We have new healing going on today. And we have two things happening at the same time. Intense addiction throughout America and the rest of the world. And we have an incredible awareness of recovery processes. And we have an acceptance that recovery involves spirituality. Most recovery programs in hospitals throughout America involve the spiritually based 12-step program. So it's an amazing thing that we see going on today. And it's an encouraging thing that we see co going on today as millions of people try to take that journey that will lead them from being in touch with the lower self and move them toward the higher self and all the wonderful ideals and aspirations that are included there. It's quite a journey. It's a wonderful journey. And I want to wish you joy on you, in your journey. Thank you for being with us today.